Hello friends, I'm going to talk to you about type 1 diabetes and celiac disease. Now that's going to be my, the flow of my presentation. I'm going to talk a little bit about the introduction, the definition of the disease, the epidemiology, the genetic basis, the possible environmental fa factors in the pathophysiology, the emerging role of gut microbiome and the pathophysiology of celiac disease, the possible clinical features, how to diagnose, the complications, treatment and take home messages. So it was in the 1960s that it was first understood that celiac disease and type 1 diabetes both seem to go hand in hand. Both are immune mediated disorders and they share certain susceptibility factors including HLA and now we are realizing that gut microbiome and infectious agent possibly modulate immunity to increase the risk of both type 1 diabetes as well as celiac disease. Now type 1 diabetes as we know is characterized by antibody mediated destruction of the beta cells of the pancreatic islands. Celiacs is a polygenic systemic immune mediated enteropathy triggered by dietary gluten and is characterized by the presence of specific serum antibody response. Celiacs is the commonest or one of the commonest apart from say hypothyroidism, autoimmune disease occurring in type 1 children and adults. It is estimated that about 8% of type 1 diabetes individuals actually have celiac disease. Now if you compare that with 1% in the general population, it's 8 times commoner in patients with type 1 diabetes. Of course there's regional variations. The lowest incidence is from Finland and the highest is from Algeria. Even in India, if you look at eastern part of India where I come from, celiacs is rather uncommon. We get about what, 2%, 3% at the most. Whereas if you look at western India and northern India, celiacs is very, very common. And high frequency has been reported from areas consuming wheat or barley as staple crops. So that could be the reason why that happens in India as well because Eastern India is predominantly consuming rice and not wheat or barley. Now this is some of the data published from India, including the data by Dr. Bhadada's group, which suggests that there is very high prevalence of celiac disease. We have published our own data, which I'm not sharing here, where we have less than 2% celiac disease. Now, if you look at the prevalence rate of coexistent type 1 diabetes and celiac disease in different countries and regions, you can see that there is gross variability across nations in the world. Now both type 1 diabetes and celiacs are thought to be polygenic disorders with more than 30 identified loci and celiacs is seen even in first degree relatives and a concordance rate of almost 70 to 80 percent is found in monozygotic twins highlighting the importance of genetics in celiac disease. HLA2 association has also been found to have a role in causation of both type 1 and celiacs. Out of the eight celiac loci, six showed association with type 1 diabetes as well. And out of 17 loci described in type 1 diabetes, eight shows association with celiac disease. So there's a gross overlap in the loci. And if you look at the loci and the genes that we are looking at, there's a cross coexistence of these genetic susceptibility of type 1 diabetes and celiac disease in a significant group of individuals. There's overlapping environmental risk factors. It is postulated that type 1 diabetes happens more commonly in infants who are formula fed compared to breastfed individual and there's often a history of ex particularly childhood exposure to viral infections. Similar postulations are there for celiac disease as well. Early or late introduction of cereal is associated with autoimmune cell positivity. Breastfeeding may be protective for both. In terms of gut microbiome, there has been abundance of the phylum bacteroides in patients with type 1 diabetes. Patients with active celiacs have more abundant population of proteobacteria, enterobacteria, and staphylococci, with fewer firmicutes and enterococci, streptococci. Enteric microbes might actually modulate host immunity through altering the balance between the Th1 and Th17 cells.
The gut microbiome may influence autoimmune diabetes through effect on the innate immunity system, specifically the adapter molecule MYD88. There have been several hypotheses for both type 1 diabetes, which also hold good for celiacs. That is the hygiene hypothesis, the fertile field hypothesis, the old fields hypothesis, and the perfect storm hypothesis. It seems that both groups have both of these as postulated hypothesis for mechanism of having a coexistence of celiacs with type 1 diabetes. Pathophysiologically, we know in type 1 diabetes and celiacs, there is selective destruction of beta cell and enterocytes respectively. Infectious agents like adenovirus, hepatitis C, rotavirus has also been implicated for celiacs apart from the commonly implicated culprit that is gluten. Similarly, enterovirus and herpes virus are also known for type 1 diabetes. We've already talked about gut microflora. Isolation of pathogenic strains from the urinal mucosa of celiacs has also been done. And this is a summary of the various postulated mechanisms that I've already talked about in the pathway of commonality of destruction of both beta cell as well as the enterocytes. So in terms of clinical presentation, in the setting of type 1 diabetes, many patients often do not necessarily have the classic signs and symptoms of celiac. Many might actually be asymptomatic for celiacs. Individuals with subclinical disease known as silent celiacs are seropositive patients with no gastrointestinal or extraintestinal manifestation. This implies that type 1 patients may harbor florid celiac disease, which might be silent or potential celiacs. And the signs and symptoms might appear at any age and the courses of celiac and type 1 do not necessarily run a parallel course. In terms of the clinical features, if you look at the age of onset, an Australian study suggests that those with celiacs in type 1 tend to have an earlier age of onset compared to older patients who have type 1 who often don't have celiacs. And about 50% of type 1 patients diagnosed with celiacs in adulthood had celiac disease related complaints for about five years before the diagnosis, people hadn't picked them up. And there seems to be a bimodal distribution of celiacs at, the, at ages 10 and again at age about 45. And it's more common in women and girls rather than men. And less than 10% of patients with type 1 diabetes and celiac disease actually have gastrointestinal symptoms. So if you look at the symptoms of type 1 and celiacs on both sides, if you are looking at celiacs, patient might have abdominal discomfort, bloating, weight loss, most commonly and predominantly growth failure, fatigue, infertility, hypogonadism, aptus stomatitis, compensatory hyperthyroidism, dental hypoplasia, fractures due to bad bones and anemia. So if you have a child with type 1 diabetes who's, who's having growth failure and delayed puberty, in spite of reasonable glycemic control, the first differential diagnosis that one should think of is celiacs. And a majority of type 1 diabetes usually precedes celiacs. And then there might be risk of celiacs is highest in those who had the diagnosis before age 4 years. Celiac diagnosis is usually screen detected at a median age of 8 years. There was screening for type which is essential, particularly in those who are having growth failure despite optimal glycemic control. When you're talking about screening, most guidelines suggest that screening with anti-TTG, IgA, and also confirmed by the endomycial antibody or IgG in patients with IgA deficiency, because that is possibly the best way of diagnosing with high sensitivity and specificity. IgA deficiency happens in 1 in 500. Other guidelines recommend retesting at intervals with no firm evidence, but usually it's stated that you should recheck every two to three years. The ISPAD recommends screening for celiac disease at diagnosis of type 1 diabetes and every five years thereafter, and less frequently in successive five years. So if you're look at that, looking at the serology, the commonest test that we are doing is the tissue transglutaminase IgA, and that's recommended test for screening. And if you look at the deaminated gliadin peptide, and also the endomycial antibody is what we are doing more commonly. Antigliadin IgA and antigliadin IgG is often not done in clinical practice.
If you're looking to confirm the diagnosis of celiac disease in the presence of an elevated antibody level, a small bile biopsy is needed to confirm the diagnosis. And usually multiple samples are taken, at least five, because there's often patchy involvement of the gut. We'll talk about the Marsh classification a little later. For clearly symptomatic patients with high TTG titers, celiacs can be diagnosed with without duodenal biopsy, particularly if the EMEA IgA level is positive and the patient is HLA DQ2 and DQ8 haplotype positive. Now, this is what the modified Marsh classification looks at. It looks at intraepithelial lymphocytes per 100 enterocytes, looks at the CRIPS and the villi of the biopsy sample of the duodenum, and this is how it is classified into type 0, 1, 2, 3, A, B, and C, progressively more severe disease, as you can see in this particular slide in the top row that you can see there's gradually more and more progressive disease in with villus atrophy. Now, what happens if, it, if a child has celiac disease in type 1 diabetes? So, there's more likely to be erratic glycemic control because of the GI problems. Type 1 diabetes with celiacs have an increased propensity of hypoglycemia, interfering with carbohydrate absorption, and there might be significantly lower insulin requirement among children with type 1 and celiac than with type 1 alone. Type 1 with celiac have, are at a greater risk of nephropathy and retinopathy, particularly with increased duration of celiac disease. Celiacs are at an increased risk of autoimmune disease such as autoimmune thyroid disorder. Treatment of celiac in type 1 is the same as you would do in other isolated individuals with celiac disease. Strict gluten-free diet should be initiated for those people with serology or histological evidence of celiac. And you've got to get rid of wheat, rye and barley in the diet. Dietitian's consultation is essential. Vitamins to be supplemented because there are certain vitamins in gluten-free diet, there's lack of it and because of the GI problem. Dietitians do have a tough time because, you know, the moment you take out the gluten-containing stuff in your diet, you tend to replace it with other food stuff and which often have high glycemic index. So you've got to figure out a way of replacing the gluten-free diet with other food stuff which do not have high glycemic index. Dietary management is complicated when both of them coexist. Dose of exogenous insulin is to be adjusted. Hypoglycemia alert is mandatory. In terms of treatment outcome, most people will do improve well in two to four weeks after being off gluten. A portion of patients with persistent symptoms are called non-responsive celiac disease and should be higher, referred on to higher centers. Complete elimination of gluten from the diet can lead to clinical, serological and even histological remission in most cases. Serology should be rechecked after three to four months and thereafter yearly when symptoms have disappeared. So if I have to summarize in terms of the take home message, celiac disease can coexist with type 1 diabetes and is often asymptomatic. It should be particularly ruled out in children with growth failure in type 1 diabetes. ESPAD guideline talks about screening for it at diagnosis in every five years and if symptoms are there. Erratic glycemic control might be a possibility. Growth failure might be a possibility. Gluten-free diet often normalizes the clinical, serological and histopathological features. I shall stop there and thank you for your patient hearing.